Hello poetry lovers and poetry curious. Today I'm going to read to you from the selected poetry of Yehuda Amakai. So he is an Israeli poet and this is um, translated a translated selected poetry of his work. So selected poetry um, takes the poet's work publication by publication. So for example, in, um, in the table of contents here, it has the name of a book, and then it's taking um, what the editors of this particular volume consider to be um, his best work. And this, this might be selected by him, I'm guessing. It's not giving credit to anybody else, so these may be what he considers his best poems in these volumes. Uh, so this starts in 1955 and goes to 1980, 1989, and he was born in um, 1924 and he died in the year 2000. This book was originally published in the Selected Poetry. It was originally published in 1986, and then it was release, released again in 1996. And then this latest version, which I have here, was published in 2013. So that's saying a lot, actually that a book of selected poetry would have repeated editions up to 13 years after the poet's death is really saying a lot. Um, he was nominated, I didn't see a specific number, but when I looked online it said he was nominated numerous times, several times, these are the kinds of phrasing they were using, for the Nobel, Pri the Nobel Prize in Literature, but never received it. So highly respected, and that's why I got this book to finally read a volume of Yehuda Amakai. Now, he's not going to be my favorite poet. <laughs> I'm going to read you some of my favorite poems from this volume, and I hope they give you um, a good impression of him. But this was a difficult read for me. I, you know, and I'm no arbiter of taste, right? So <laughs> that's why I'm telling you all of his accolades. And I'm going to read poetry to you that I'm, I'm assuming that you will enjoy. I enjoyed it. But having to read this much of his poetry was too much for me. Um, I would say this, if you are curious about him, Well, I will put a link down in the description box to his poetry on the Poetry Foundation website, because that's the best way to look at them and decide if he's the person for you. But what I found was, as one would expect from an Israeli poet, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch, that he was very rooted in his country, the trials of his country and his peoples, and he identified with them very strongly. At least that's my perception. And since I am not of that heritage, there's, you know, quite a bit of this poetry that I could not directly relate to. Yeah. I don't know how else to say that. I mean, I can even look at it as, you know, people accuse uh, people in the United States of lacking a sense of history. Well, in this, I think I'm guilty in this case. Even, even not being from, uh, you know, not being Jewish, not being Middle Eastern, um, he spent the early years of his life in Germany. He was born in Germany. Um, but anyway, so there's that. 
I, I can't say that I have a bias, but I have I have my own cultural <laughs> weaknesses, I suppose. Um, but I will tell you this that so I essentially gave my lukewarm impression. It's like this is not the guy for me. It was a struggle for me to get through a complete volume of his work like this. So I reviewed it on Goodreads, not just a general review on Goodreads. I, I pretty much only post my reviews in a group that I belong to for the purpose of reading and reviewing poetry. It's called the Poetry Reader's Challenge. So I reviewed it in there and gave this lukewarm review of how he just didn't... There was never a point in here where I felt momentum to read onward. And, um, you know, I like to, if I'm going to say I like a poet, there's going to be that momentum. Um, you know, there were far more poems that kind of left me flat than, than actually, you know, that I felt that I marked. Let me say that. That's, that's how I, I mark it in the table of contents if I like it. And there were many that I marked, but there were far more that I, um, that I did not. And that makes for a rough reading experience and a slow reading experience that never gained any momentum. So I did that in, almost immediately. And in this group, a, a review can sit for weeks, <laughs> certainly days without getting any response. And almost immediately, I had one defender and as a defender, I, I respect a lot, and she gave a very articulate defense of Yehuda Amakai and this particular book that she had read this particular book, and it's one of her favorite books of poetry. So I'm, I'm giving you that as a, yeah, as an alternative to my response. And then my co-moderator in that group, who I also respect a lot, she came on and said it. She also was very impressed with this book of poetry, not just Yehuda Amakai here and there, but this book, this specific book, she was also very impressed with it, but she said, well, it was a long time ago. Well, I don't know. I don't expect that books that I love, that I, I won't love them later. Um, I mean, that happens. I think that happens more, I think, if it's a childhood book or something. But So there you go. And I'm going to read to you, and the only reason I would read to you is because there are some really good poems in here. So I'm going to read to you as many as I can get through, because I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 that I have jotted down as ones I would like to read to you. And, um, and we'll see if I, we make it through that many. Uh, most of them are not too long. And I thought I was going to say something else, but now I don't remember, so let's just dive in. So the first one is Mayer. And so we're starting, this would be from his volume that was between, that was collecting his works between 1948 and 1966. So I'm starting with his earlier work and then going forward. So Mayer. It's sad to be the mayor of Jerusalem. It's terrible. How can a man be mayor of such a city? What can he do with it? Build and build and build. And at night the stones of the mountains crawl down and surround the stone houses, like wolves coming to howl at the dogs who have become the slaves of men. So yes, that's a fascinating poem. I'm, poem. I'm not going to stay long on any of these poems. I'm just going to go ahead and give you the sampling. So the next one is on page 59. I think I was going to tell you before that I had a bunch more that um, that I had marked than these what, 13 or whatever I just said. Um, that I had marked, and then when I got done with the book, I went back and read all of the ones that I had marked, and I erased the ones that were like, well, I don't think that that is something I want to read to the folks on YouTube. So, so yes, this is the selected, selected, selected 
um, Yehuda Amakai by, by me. So, Now in the Storm. And this was um, from a volume that collected his poetry between 1963 and 1968. Now in the storm before the calm. I can tell you what in the calm before the storm I didn't say, because they would have heard us and discovered our hiding place. That we were just neighbors in the fierce, fierce wind, brought together in the ancient Hamson, from Mesopotamia, and the latter prophets in my veins kingdom prophesied into the firmament of your flesh. And the weather was good for us and for the heart, and the sun's muscles were flexed inside us and golden. In the Olympiad of emotions, on the faces of thousands of spectators, so that we would know and remain, and there would again be clouds. Look, we met in a protected place, in the angle where history began to arise, quiet and safe from all the hasty events. And the voice began to tell stories in the evening, by the children's bed. And now it's too early for archaeology, and too late to repair what has been done. Summer will arrive, and the clop-clop of the hard sandals will sink in the soft sand forever. So he has this very deep sense, ancient sense of history and his place or moment in it. Um, okay, next we're moving on to a volume that was written in 1971, and we're going to look at the poem Wild Peace on page 88. Wild Peace Now in the peace of a ceasefire, not even the vision of the wolf and the lamb, but rather as in the heart when the excitement is over and you can talk only about a great weariness. I know that I know how to kill. That makes me an adult, and my son plays with a toy gun that knows how to open and close its eyes and say, Mama. A peace without the big noise of beating swords into plowshares, without words, without the thud of the heavy rubber stamp. Let it be, let it be light, floating like lazy white foam, a little rest for the wounds. Who, spe who speaks of healing? And the howl of the orphans is passed from one generation to the next as in a relay race. The baton never falls. Let it come like wildflowers, suddenly, because the field must have it. Wild peace. And so even though it's talking about peace, there's a very melancholy tone, and I think that that's very common of his poetry as well. So what's next? I think it's called Song of Continuity. And we're moving on to page 115. Whoops. And I went a little past it. And we're in, what is this from? This is from a volume published in 1978. The next two are from a volume published in 1978. Song of Continuity. Oh, songs. Plural. Songs of continuity, landmines and graves. That what, that's what turns up when you're making a house or a road. Then come the black crow people from Mea she, Shearim. Of course, I have no idea how to pronounce some of these words. With their bitter screeching, a body, a dead body. Then the young soldiers with their hands of the night before dismantling iron to decipher death. So come on, let's not build a house. Let's not pave a road. Let's make a house that's folded inside the heart, a road wound up on a spool in the soul, deep inside, 
and we won't die ever. People here live inside prophecies that have come true as inside a heavy cloud that didn't disperse after, after an explosion. And so, in their lonely blindness, they touch one another between the legs, between day and night, because they have no other time and they have no other place, and the prophets died a long time ago. All right, so now we're going to do, again, same year, the diameter of the bomb. The diameter of the bomb. The, di the diameter of the bomb was 30 centimeters, and the diameter of its effective range about 7 meters, with 4 dead and 11 wounded. And around these, in a larger circle of pain and time, two hospitals are scattered and one graveyard. But the young woman who was buried in the city she came from, at a distance of more than a hundred kilometers, enlarges the circle, the circle considerably. And the solitary man mourning her death at the distant shores of a country far across the sea includes the entire world in the circle. And I won't even mention the howl of orphans that reaches up to the throne of God and beyond, making a circle with no end and no God. Next, we're moving on to a volume that, a volume of his poetry from 1980, and I will have three poems from that. So, 131. So, let me see here. Yep. Okay, there are candles that remember. There are candles that remember. There are candles that remember for a full 24 hours. That's what the label says. And candles that remember for eight hours, and eternal candles that guarantee a man will be remembered by his children. I'm older than most of the houses in this country and most of its forests, which are taller than I am, but I'm still the child I was, carrying a bowl full of precious liquid from place to place as in a dream, careful not to spill a drop, afraid I'll be, I'll be punished, and hoping for a kiss when I arrive. Some of my father's friends are still living in the city, scattered about like antiques, without a plaque or an explanation. Late in my life I had a daughter who will be 22 in the year 2000. Her name is Emanuela, which means, may God be with us. My soul is experienced and built like mountain terraces against erosion. I'm a hold fast, a go-between, a buckle man. And then also, his, the next poem on this page, which is, on the day my daughter was born, no one died. On the day my daughter was born, not a single person died in the hospital. And at the entrance gate, the sign said, Today, Kohanim are permitted to enter. And it was the longest day of the year. In my great joy, I drove with my friend to the hills of Sha'ar Ha'gai. We saw a bare, sick pine tree, nothing on it but a lot of pine cones. G, or Zvi, I don't know how to say his name. Zvi said, trees like that are about to die. Wait a minute. Zvi said, trees that are about to die produce more pine cones than healthy trees. And I said to him, that was a poem and you didn't realize it. Even though you're a man of exact sciences, you've made a poem. And he answered, And you, though you're a man of dreams, have made an exact little girl with all the exact instruments for her life. And 
What's the last one? This poem without end. Oh, it's on page 142, so I have a bit of a space here. Poem without end. Inside the brand new museum, there's an old synagogue. Inside the synagogue is me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. Inside the museum, a synagogue. Inside it, me. Inside me, my heart. Inside my heart, a museum. I think that really kind of sums up <laughs> his stance in life and, and what kind of that all infuses his poetry. Um, all right, so now we're moving on to a volume that he wrote in 1983. And what, oh, wait a second, that turns right here. Oh, 19, okay, 1924. I was born in 1924. If I were a violin my age, I wouldn't be one of the best. As a wine, I'd be first rate or I'd be vinegar. As a dog, I'd be dead. As a book, I'd just be getting expensive or be thrown away by now. As a forest, I'd be young. As a machine, ridiculous. As a human being, I'm tired, very tired. I was born in 1924. When I think about human beings, I see only those who were born the same year as I, whose mothers lay in labor with mine wherever they were, in hospitals or dark houses. Today, on my birthday, I would like to say a solemn prayer for you whose lives are already pulled down by the weight of hopes and disappointments, whose deeds grow smaller and whose gods multiply. You are all brothers of my hope, companions of my despair. May you find lasting peace, the living in their lives, the dead in being dead. And whoever remembers his childhood best is the winner, if there are any winners. And on 146, we have statistics. For every man in a rage, there are always two or three back patters who will calm him. For every weeper, many more tear wipers. For every happy man, plenty of sad ones who will want to warm themselves at his happiness. And every night, at least one man can't find his way home. Or his home has moved to another place, and he runs around in the streets superfluous. Once I was waiting with my little son at the station as an empty bus went by. My son said, look, a bus full of empty people. So lastly, um, a poem from 1989, a volume that he published in 1989. And it's called, What Kind of Man? What kind of man are you? People ask me. I am a man with a complex network of pipes in my soul, sophisticated machineries of emotion, and a precisely monitored memory system of the late 20th century, but with an old body from ancient days and a god more obsolete even than my body. I am a man for the surface of the earth. Deep places, pits, and holes in the ground make me nervous. Tall buildings and mountain tops terrify me. I am not like a piercing fork, nor a cutting knife, nor a scooping spoon, nor a flat, wily spatula that sneaks in from underneath. At most, I'm a heavy and clumsy pestle that mashes good and evil together for the sake of a little flavor, a little fragrance. Guideposts don't tell me where to go. I conduct my business quietly, diligently, as if carrying out a long will that began to be written the moment I was born. Now I am standing on the sidewalk, weary, 
leaning on a parking meter. I can stand here for free, my own man. I'm not a car, I'm a human being, a man-god, a god-man, whose days are numbered. Hallelujah. So there you go, a sampling of Yehuda Amakai, highly respected poet internationally, nominated numerous times for the Nobel Prize in Literature, and had some really wonderful poems that I just read for you, but overall, this book was just too much for me. <laughs> too much of Yehuda for me. Um, but if I could have a little pamphlet with all of the poems I just read you, I would be super happy. But I am going to turn this book back out into the wilds in my, in my community and uh, let somebody else sample, sample Yehuda Amakai. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.